Oscar-winning director Anthony Minghella died last Tuesday morning in a London hospital. He suffered complications after a surgery to treat tonsil cancer. He was 54. Anthony Minghella was best known for his adaptations of the novels Coal Mountain, The English Patient, and The Talented Mr. Ripley. He was a gifted screenwriter and director. His best films explored tragic love stories on large canvases. David Carr of the New York Times wrote that Mengele's films used a careful eye for cultural and historical detail to explore how the dynamics of class pushed people into roles and behavior not of their choosing. He made audiences believe in his flawed characters, struggles, and stories. Anthony Mengele was born in England to Italian parents who ran an ice cream factory. He began his career as a playwright, but he also wrote scripts for television and radio. The English Patient was his greatest achievement. That film was nominated for nine Academy Awards, including Best Picture. In 1997, Mengele won the Oscar for Best Director. In 2006, he also directed Madame Butterfly for the Metropolitan Opera. Alex Ross of The New Yorker wrote, Mengele's Butterfly offers several of the most piercingly beautiful images I've seen in an opera house. He was also a partner in Sidney Pollock's production company, Mirage, and most recently he was a producer of George Clooney's Oscar-nominated Michael Clayton. Mengele made several appearances on this program. Here he is talking about the films he made and why they were important to him. You've broken your ankle, and I'm going to have to try and bind it. I think you've also broken your wrist and maybe some ribs, which is why it's hurting you to breathe. I'm going to have to walk to El Taj. Although, given all the traffic in the desert these days, I'm bound to bump into one army or another. And then I'll come back, and you will be fine. You promise? I promise. I'll come back for you. I promise. I'll never leave you. In what way did it lend itself to adaptation, and in what way did it drive you crazy? Well, I think the richness. You know, somebody said about, I, and I, Michael will know this novelist, who said that you know, the Eskimos have 50 words for snow, we should have 50 for love. Yeah. Yes. And in a way, yeah. in, in, in the book, there are so many types of love examined. Not only, you know, some, when you say this film is romantic, I always get nervous because I think it's not the romance of chocolate box and tenderness right. and sweetness. And a lot of the love in the film is coruscating, difficult, painful, damaging, uh, tragic. Yeah. On the other hand, the, 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 the part of Michael's book, the beauty of it is in its language. It's, the, the prose is exquisite. And film is not exquisite in its prose. It can't be. It's much more mechanical and humble movie. This, this film is much more interested in trying to pull out what I felt was at the heart of her book. And, and I think that the whole business of adaptation to me is just to try and find a way of walking into a, a room, having been the ideal reader and saying, this is what I thought I read, this is what really excited me, this is what interested me, this is what I want to argue with in this yeah. book. I'm extremely compulsive in the preparation of a film. Um, <laughs> Not surprised. I, you know, a lot of time working on the screenplay, then six months with the production designer patrolling the sort of boot of Italy, trying to find places I wanted to shoot in. A long time, just looking and thinking, drawing planning and then when I show up on the set I try not to think about any of that and to just witness as best I can what's in front of me and some miraculous things happen if you don't look where you thought you were going to look but just look over there and you suddenly think there's a whole world here that can come into this movie because Italy is a, such a significant character in the film and the whole sort of sense of a different Italy, a real Italy as opposed to an American or British idea of what Italy is. Mm -hmm. When I got home I'd had a screenplay, when I got home I had four hours of material, cut material, because I just looked so much and saw so much and the film grew in front of me. And then it's rather like, you know, my mother's a wonderful cook and she makes uh, great pasta and great ragu and she would put the sauce on a stove on Friday and we'd eat the food on Sunday and, and the, the sauce would be simmering on the stove. And so part of the process for me is with Walter Murch, who's my editor and sort of teacher, is that we, we, we put the film on the stove, as it were, and just wait and let it boil away and boil away and boil and to try and find what the film really is as opposed to the film I thought I was making. I'm not smiling in it. I don't know how to do that. Hold the smile. Ida. Well, 
the, the humiliating truth of this is that when I'm writing, I'm everybody. You know, You're all the characters I'm, yourself. If you, you came into it. my room, you would laugh at me seeing me working. Then I emerge after a long time with a screenplay, and there's that shocking moment where you realize that other people are going to be doing these parts, and you have to go and find them. And um, I think it's very interesting that, that um, this is the second time I've worked with Jude. And I have this awful feeling that of the beauty and the beast, you know, that I'm, I, I, I'm the sort of ugly background person who has found this man to stand in for him in some odd way, the sort of perfect man on screen while I'm words, lurking can, like an ogre off screen. Man. <laughs> I've been looking for love. Out there. I thought I might have found it. Did you? I think I might have lost the love I did have. The love of my life. Did I? Happy endings are associated with untruths. Whereas to me, it, it seems like there's something worth talking about in terms of persevering, that love is worth coping with even when it goes wrong. But, so it's, a, it's asking for second chances for a lot of people in this movie, for Juliet's character, for Robin's character, right. for Jude's character. I think that's really worth talking about in a movie. What was the toughest challenge for you, though, in terms of achieving that? I think that what happens with me is I fall in love with actors and performers and stories and the truth of things. I want to keep pushing in every direction. And then you end up with too big a meal. And movies yeah. are always... You know, people think my movies are long anyway. For me, you know, one of the, the cliches of filmmaking is people always say, cut to the chase, cut to the chase, cut to the chase. And I'm only interested in things other than the chase. You know, I love the moments when people yeah. are yeah. marooned or paralyzed or can't say what they want to say or when language fails and when you just let actors take over. And I love Do you look at The English Patient as just a movie that's, in a sense, gave me international acclaim? I've never seen it since I made it, so I don't I don't know anything about it other than that it forms some lifelong relationships. Like Michael Ondaatje, I got a call from in the car as I was coming up here. There are there are people who will never leave my life because of that film.